Shaping's long been dead for modern manufacturing, but does it still have an application in micro-machining? I recently made a video where I used this surface grinder as a shaper. I mentioned that I use both my CNC and manual grinders as shapers pretty often these days, and a lot of people were curious about that. Not so much the logistics, as it's a pretty basic concept to wrap your head around, but why I would do that, and I wanted to make a pretty quick video just explaining that. So the first cost is, or the first point is cost and, and ease. I can generate whatever form I need pretty quickly and with materials lying around. So I could just grab whatever piece of carbide and put the customer specific requirements onto that and I have the tool. And it'll hold up for what I generally have to do as a job shop. Uh, whereas if I were to use my high speed mill, I'm probably gonna have to buy at least two because I always need a little bit of redundancy, uh, very small, very expensive end mills. Um, and so, you know, you do enough jobs a week that, that redundancy you're purchasing starts to really compile. Uh, and so being able to bring your tooling requirements in-house a little bit by going to shaping versus high-speed milling has, has some attraction to it. And then two, uh, point two, it's, it's, it's pretty quick. Um, I had a f job this summer where it was very shallow slot, but there was 800 of them per part. There were four parts. And so, <laughs> and so when you add that up, milling it, the, the weeks of micro milling just became a real problem or I was able to feed it several magnitudes times quicker in a shaping format. And uh, the, the, the speed at which you can run a even micro-sized shaping cutter is really, really impressive. Uh, basically, as fast as the machine table will go, you're not gonna hit the surface cutting speed limit of that material and cutter. So yeah, cost and speed, I guess, kind of what drives that decision. Um, and then sometimes it's just, it's got a nice feedback loop. Uh, if you're doing something sketchy, uh, you can you can kind of feel the sketchiness, so to speak. Uh, like if you're parting off an extremely delicate part, uh, it's, it's really nice to be able to do it on this and catch the part as it comes off. Whereas if you're doing it in a high-speed mill, it might launch into oblivion. So uh, I'm gonna put together a few clips and you can decide if it makes sense. Um, it's brought a lot of benefit to my operation and to my customers. It saves them money and time, and uh, they're, they're pleased that I offer it for them now. So, hope you enjoy. This is kind of the basic setup for shaping on the grinder. We remove the spindle and place an Aroa chuck where the spindle normally is, and it allows us to use standard Aroa holders like... Uh, like you would a quick change tool post system on a lathe. And then the, the tooling that we use to do the shaping is reminiscent of, of lathe tooling in a lot of ways. This is a very basic V form. And uh, I'd done this project in the summer and the customer wants me to try a harder material. So while the grinder was still set up as a shaper. I put this all together and tested it out in a harder material. Um, this is just brass, but I wanted you to get a sense of how easily it forms a chip and how easily it, it allows micro features to be put in. It's a little tedious hand cranking to position each time manually. Uh, this is a breeze on the CNC, but it was set up doing grinding work and uh, for just playing around the manual's fine. But normally when we do this on the CNC grinder, it's as fast as we could feed the table.
I retract the cutter upwards. Um, some kind of spring actuated device like a clapper on a shaper would be pretty neat. Um, but if I'm doing a lot of this, I'll do it on the CNC and then it's just a simple programming fix where manually you have to retract the head each time and then get it back down to its original position. So this particular feature set, it's a V pattern that repeats, but it leaves like a little bit of the original width uh, or original surface up at the width. Here it is on the CNC, same pattern. And the, the chip just flies off. So we did that in two passes and then we take like a spring pass, which I ruled that out after doing enough of these, we don't take the spring pass any longer. Here's a close-up of the Aroa mount. This is a 5 thousandths wide groover. We're going to uh, use that on an upcoming project. That's a human hair, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're dealing with here. Uh, end mills that diameter aren't really any fun. And if you compare the feed rate of a 5 thou end mill or 125 microns compared to this, it's just laughable. We're taking uh, four tenths or ten microns per pass, and uh, yeah, you still get a nice chip lo or chip curling up off, and then that slot just kind of sinks down in there. Another benefit of shaping over milling is sometimes the floor finish is critical um, for like a ceiling application, and uh, a shaping you don't get those uh, spiral floor marks. Uh, and it's a lot easier to seal off on a shaped floor. Here is the shaped feature under the dinoscope. And you can see just like that nice straight pattern on the floor. Unfortunately, I don't have enough focus for both top and bottom. Here's a set of intersecting V's. Um, you can see the way it throws light, just how even the depth is between them. Unfortunately, my dinoscope, while it gives you an amazing in-person view, the video capture software is underwhelming. Um, but uh, can I use some blue tack to clean out the V's? There's usually a little cutting oil and debris down in the roots. Uh, and then you can get a pretty good idea just how, how precise the floors are on these V's. Just how evenly they space out. So I just wanted to clear up a couple points. Uh, First is probably you're wondering if it's on the grinder, why not just use a grinding wheel? Um, and with micro-sized features, there is kind of a low limit for what a grinding wheel can accomplish. Uh, that, that square slot we did was about five thousandths of an inch or 125 microns. And what limits a grinding wheel is good judgment is you don't want to go narrower on a wheel than three abrasive grains. Um, so it depends on how big of a grain you're using, type of grain and type of bond. But five thousandths wide wheels do exist uh, in the dicing world. It's not anything I want to mess with, though. Uh, that that shaper bit was way less drama than a five thou wide grinding wheel. And then on the, the V wheel, same kind of drama. Uh, the abrasive grain diameter is going to leave a little bit of radius. Um, and we wanted a nice sharp corner in those V grooves. So again, just move it over to shaping. Um, and then some of the problems we see in milling 
And the reason we might go over to shaping is really long, like double digit hour run times, micro milling. It's, uh, it's really a battle of heat. The spindle on a high speed machining center is a, a really good heater. You know, the, the frame's warming up, the spindle's warming up, coolant's warming up. I have separate cooling loops on all that stuff, but even stuff like the, the tool, the shank can get warm and grow. Uh, so uh, the shank and holder, or you know, so you're, you're constantly trying to figure out how to battle that heat, whereas you put it on a machine with no heat, you know, that doesn't even have electricity requirements other than the digital readout. Uh, all of a sudden that really kind of goes away. So yeah, um, yeah, it's just, it's a convenient way of doing things. So I hope you give it some consideration. Thank you.